everybody. Um, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics when teaching public health, um, the topics of health disparities as well as social determinants of health, really understanding the context of which people live to try to make sense of why different people have different types of health outcomes, um, whether it's more positive or more negative. Um, so today we're going to focus on things that make us diverse and how our demographic information also impacts our likelihood of how we're treated in healthcare, as well as some of our health outcomes and, and try to understand why, why might there be some differences. So um, we're going to start off today by briefly uh, talking about the film um, Unnatural Causes that you were to watch for homework and completed the homework quiz for. And uh, then we'll get through and talk about some of the health disparities that we see in our nation. Um, so this is also a picture that you see here, this health equity, health equality, and uh, health disparity. This is a picture of how to create more health equity, how to create more equal health for all. So if you see that equity, it's got the same part for equal. So with health equity, you're starting to say, what can we do? What can we put into place so that people have an equal chance of having healthier outcomes? Whereas where you're focusing on health disparity, you're trying to ask the question of what's going on here for there to be differences, right? That disparate. Why is one population getting a more negative outcome than another? So um, again, you're kind of asking with um, with the question of health equity, uh, what kind of measures will will every population need the same type of measure, the same type of intervention to have equal health outcomes? And pretty much the answer is no. Um, but I just thought this was a, a great picture. This was created by the CDC. Um, and I just thought it was a really great illustration to use just to get us get us started for the lecture. All right. So unnatural causes. I, I really hope you guys enjoyed this film. As, as much as I enjoy um, watching it as well. I think I've told you I've watched the film numerous times and each time I watch it, I get something different out of it. Um, this would usually be the time where I start asking you questions. What did you learn? What did you think about it? Tell me about the different characters in the film. Uh, what were the differences? Tell me about excess death. What does that mean? What do people's jobs look like? Uh, but since it's a little bit less interactive since it's a film, I'll just kind of tell you what I think about it. Um, so again, the film was clearly a little bit older, right? Clearly made in like the mid early 2000s. Um, I forgot which year it was actually produced, but it shows the history of people living very different lives. You've got someone who is the, um, CEO of a hospital. He lives a pretty cushy life, right? He's got a mansion. He gets to go running in a nice neighborhood. He probably has pretty great access to care. Seems like a pretty privileged guy, um, and he gets to take vacations. He gets to eat dinner with his family. He's got, again, a, a pretty cushy life. Uh, next up, we've got someone who's a research assistant in, in the same exact hospital. I think that's one thing I liked is that all of these people were somehow affiliated with the same work organization, right? The hospital, that one hospital in Kentucky. So... Next up, again, we have the research assistant, and she has pretty much a, a, a middle-class socioeconomic status, right? She's not nearly as wealthy as the guy who's a CEO, but she's also not destitute. She's not poor. She's, she's living a pretty comfortable life. Uh, her life is, is not quite as cushy as the CEO, but it's, uh, it's, definitely, um, it's definitely not the worst condition that she could live. And she's still probably paying off some student debt. She still has a job where she's got some control of her life. Uh, but again, it's, it's not nearly as uh, controlled as say the CEO. Next up, we have the janitor. He might be the most fun character to watch. He's lively. His wife is lively, but you can see some clear differences between his life, the research assistant and the CEO, right? Uh, if you can remember from the film, you can see that there was a, a shooting in his neighborhood not long ago. He doesn't get a lot of vacations. His neighborhood's not the safest. He's got a history of, of uh, poor financing in his life where he, he comes from little to no money and, and kind of lives in that same uh, cycle of poverty. Um, 
his, his opportunities are less. He doesn't have quite the financial freedom that uh, other people in the film have. His, his health um, may be different or, or poor. Or, yeah, you know, he just, again, has a very different life. Um, but um, he, he works in that same hospital, and he works as a janitor in that hospital. And you can, you can see with the different power dynamics, he's got less power in his job. He's told what to do. He's told what mess to clean up on what floor. He's, um, he's, he's more so kind of informed or ordered when to drop a task and go work on another task. He doesn't have that autonomy in his job to say, I'm going to focus on this right now. And when I'm done with this task, I'm going to focus on this, right? So that, that's stressful. Um, so not only is he earning less income, which gives him less opportunity within his job, within his life, within what to do with his spare time when he has spare time, he also has less power. And, and it's that combination, right, um, that, was talk that they were talking about when they were talking about the, the health wealth gradient. It's, it's a mix of that perceived power in your life paired with your income that, that really dictates how stressful you perceive your life. Um, and we know that stress is bad for you, right? So if you can recall all the ways that stress is really bad for your life, you'd see that there's this hormone that your body produces in response to stress, and it's called cortisol. Cortisol builds up in your blood ways and your blood pathways, and over time, it can lead to increased risk for cardiovascular diseases, for mainly a heart attack, uh, but it can also lead to stroke, um, and a whole host of negative outcomes. Stress and stress hormones were really, really bad for your health. And the, uh, the film showed you two studies, right? They showed you the studies of, of the macaque monkeys, which if you didn't believe that monkeys were little jerks in the first place, um, that study should show you monkeys, monkeys are jerks. Uh, they pick on each other. There's a social hierarchy. Um, the macaque monkeys that had a higher place in their society, a higher power within, within their society, had less stress and could really kind of order the other lowly monkeys around. Um, they could pick on them. They could, again, they just had different social standings. And those with higher levels of power seemed to fare better in life and in health. And those with lower perceived power seemed to have poor health outcomes and even increased risk the same diseases that humans have um, in terms of developing uh, stress-related negative health outcomes. There's also the study, the Whitehall study, where uh, people were exposed to different level, different. Um, they were exposed to viruses, right? And based on how their immune functioning worked and how much stress they got and how much sleep they got was really indicative of whether or not they'd actually develop the common cold, right? So they were exposed to this cold strand. And what, what did they find? They found that the people with lower levels of stress, their immune system seemed to work a little bit better than those who were exposed to chronic stress. And they found that those exposed to chronic stress were more likely to develop illnesses than, than those who were exposed to less stress and had better immune functioning. So all in all, I think this is just a really interesting film. Um, and, and of course, we've got the last character, um, who is someone who uh, can qualify for unemployment due to her illness, but then if she starts working and she wants to be able to work, then she no longer qualifies for unemployment. She's trying to figure out how to make ends meet. How does she make sure she gets enough food? Um, again, she's living in a cycle of poverty that's really at the lowest end of poverty, right? Kind of bordering near homelessness in, in her case. And, and she's got different disabilities. She's having a hard time ensuring she gets the medication she needs. Um, so again, it just shows you the different spectrum of socioeconomic level and the different level of power you have in your life and, and the way the different types of outcomes you, um, you potentially could have. And granted, there are more outcomes that you could have, but this just illustrates four main individuals and, and their particular outcomes. What I also really like towards the end of the film 
is that the that the film starts describing how um, the policy that has public health implications is more often social policy. That uh, so, if we're thinking of Frieden's health impact pyramid, those those policies that have some of the greatest impact on your social determinants of health, your housing and your income and how much you're working and even education and access to education really came from social policies. So the eight hour workday, which reduced the amount of time and, and helped kind of set some laws for child labor laws and for just labor laws in general, had an impact on health. Um, you know, the GI Bill, which allowed for veterans to come home after after fighting in wars or uh, being deployed and come back and have access to education and affordable education, was something that, again, in turn impacts opportunity in your life, as and, and that later down the road impacts health. Um, you know, the creation of Medicaid and Medicare has impacted health. So, uh, you know, access to affordable housing and who has access to that Whereas it used to be a lot harder for racial and ethnic minorities to be able to uh, qualify for um, housing and ur urban development grants and programs, HUD. Um, over time, we've been working to change those, to make them fair and more equitable so that people had an equal chance at health. So these are just all things that are social policies that actually work to help decrease health disparities. Um, so again, I just kind of want you to, to remember that. Um, again, I, I can't say it enough. Uh, public health is so much more than just telling people how to live a healthier life. It's also about what are those policies and what are, what are different ways of life that we can impact through social policy and, and what ways can um, government entities start reshaping the rules by which we live that in turn will impact people's quality of life, health, and the context of which they live. All right, so next up, um, this was something that when I was a PhD student, uh, one of my professors shared with me, and I, I thought it was kind of hilarious and relevant, so I decided to share it with you guys. Um, so here are 10 tips that your doctor may have told you to, uh, to live a healthier life. Don't smoke, and if you can, stop. If you can't, cut back. Now, we know that smoking is one of the most preventable forms uh, or leads to preventable deaths, right? Stay on a balanced diet with plenty of fruit and vegetables. Eat those five a day, right? Make sure you get exercise at least three times a week. Manage, manage stress healthfully. If you drink alcohol, do so in moderation. Um, when you go out in the sun, cover up. Protect children from sunburn. Make sure you practice safer sex. Don't forget your regular checkups. Be safe on the roads and learn the first aid ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. When you think about these rules, you should think, well, that's great if the context of your life allows you to do that, right? If, if living healthfully and preventing disease was just this easy, everyone would be healthy. But let's look at some more realistic rules about how to stay healthy. Don't be poor. If you can, you stop that right now. Stop being poor. And if you can't, try not to be poor for long, right? Uh, it impacts your availability for extra time, for education, for where you live, which which um, is one of your greatest determinants of health, whether it's the type of neighborhood or living establishment, right? The access to food, the ac access to healthcare resources, the, the access to resources in general, and even the financial freedom to have extra time to be able to cope with stress more healthfully, to, to have uh, access to again, healthier nutrition and physical activity and to have a little bit more choices in your life. So just don't be poor, right? Easier said than done though, right? Uh, live near good supermarkets and affordable fresh produce stores. Just pick up and move, you know, it's just, just so easy. Live in a safe neighborhood with parks and green space. Oh, maybe like your neighbors. That's great. Uh, work in a rewarding, respected job with good pay and benefits and control over your life and work. If you work, don't lose your job. Just don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Uh, take family vacations. The more opulent, the better. Uh, make sure you have wealthy parents. Hey, uh, don't live in damp, low-quality housing. Be sure to own a car. Uh, and so you don't have to rely on underfunded public transportation that might not always be reliable and get you where you need to go on time. And learn how to fill out complex housing benefit applications in case you know you ever lose your job, become homeless and destitute, right? So 
Again, on that slide, you've got tips that people think, oh, it's so easy to avoid negative health conditions. But as you can see, a lot of this really kind of links back to socioeconomic status and kind of what you've been born into and what opportunity you've had over your life. Taking, you know, this takes into account privilege, right? That you've got access to all these things and you've got multiple choices on how to live a healthy life. This one might be a little bit more realistic on what it really takes to live a healthier life. All right. So what are health disparities? Healthy People 2020, which we know is that document, which kind of outlines how to improve the health of our nation over the years, uh, or over the years, our, our objectives and goals that we're going to try to reach over time to reduce health inequity, um, basically says health outcomes are different by your social class, your economic class, um, the environment in which you live. But really based on demographic variables or things about your life, things about your identity um, that vary based on different forms of diversity, whether it's your race and ethnicity, um, whether or not you have equal access to resources because of your race or ethnicity, because of the language you speak, because of your immigration status, based on your religion, how people treat you differently. Um, based on your, your income, which again, that film, The Unnatural Causes, really highlighted um, a, a fair share about how finances really do impact your health. Your gender, your biological sex, uh, your gender identity, how you, how you enact your gender, your sexual orientation, who you love, right? Your age, whether or not people treat you differently based on your, you know, really young or you're really old and, and, and how that, again, impacts your access to resources as well as how you're treated. Uh, your mental health status, whether or not you're seen as dangerous if you're living with a mental health condition, uh, cognitive or physical disability, where you live geographically, and other uh, characteristics that historically have impacted discrimination and bias. So here's just a picture that comes from the Healthy People 2020 site that says, again, these, these characteristics are all part of your social determinants of health. They're... Um, They've been defined over time. There's something called the social construction of reality, right? They're socially constructed. Um, society said, we're going to differentiate between all of these people based on these different demographics, based on or these different characteristics. We're going to say you can be categorized based on your, your education, you, we're going to say you can be categorized based on your income. We're going to say we can put people in little boxes based on their age, based on their race or ethnicity, based on different variables. And these are all socially defined, right? Um, when, when life began, there might not have been all these different categorizations. But over time, people have created these little boxes for other people to fit in. And that was created socially through, again, these social constructions, these, these ways of defining people. And interestingly, those in turn also impact the way people treat us, the way people view us, as well as what we have access to. So here's some examples. I want to go through and I pulled different examples from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as the Kaiser Family Foundation to just illustrate what are some of these differences. So here's, here is um, a graph or here's a chart, sorry, here's a bar chart that shows you the difference in population between 2015 and what's projected in 2045. And what I want you to take away from this is that the population's changing. You're seeing that we've got a white majority, 62%, and you'll find that they're no longer, they're still a majority, but they're not quite making up, you know, white rate, the white you know, race and ethnicity, white non-Hispanic uh, race and ethnicity is not going to be quite as sizable as it was in 2015, in 2045. So these are, again, just projections. So we're going to see an increase in the Hispanic population. Um, we're going to see a slight increase in black population. Um, and that includes African-American and African and even Latin American countries where people can be defined. You can be black and Hispanic. Um, so different, again, populations that are deemed black due to color of skin, um, as well as history and, and background of, of where ancestors were born or come from originally. Um, 
And then you've got Asian populations and, and everyone else who doesn't fall under Asian, black, Hispanic, or white make up that other. We see a slight increase from 2015 to 2045. So based on race and ethnicity, um, we want to see who fares better in terms of access to care um, compared to the white majority, right? So compared to... Um, 62% of the population in 2015, how are different races and ethnicities doing in terms of access to care and actually using care? And what you find is that the white majority has pretty much much better uh, access to care than all of the different, um, all the other different race ethnicities as defined by the Kaiser Family Foundation. Which percent of non-elderly adults, so adults, you know, up until age 50 or before age, actually, usually it's, it's defined as age 65. Um, so we see here it says from 18 to 64 years of age, who's not receiving care or who's receiving delayed care, meaning you're not getting the health care you need at the time that you need it, um, just based on right now race and ethnicity. So it's, this is a correlation. It's not saying because you are this race or ethnicity, you're getting delayed care. It's just saying, based on your your racial ethnic identity, um, and that's how it's been split up again, uh, how many people responded in the survey that they either didn't get the health care they needed or it was delayed. And you can look and see some clear disparities, right? So um, for didn't see a doctor, 14% of white population. Asian, 11%. Hispanic, 24%. Um, and uh, black populations. So when you see all these stars, by the way, you see that it is statistically significant, meaning there is a real relationship here. Um, the ones that don't have a little star by it are showing uh, there's a difference, and this is a trend, but based on statistics, it doesn't say 100% there's a relationship here. It just says there's a trend. So it's looking and, and showing that among Hispanic adults between the age of 18 to 64, Hispanic and also black populations are most likely to not see a doctor when you need care because of cost or delayed reasons for seeing care because of some other reasons. You're seeing, you're seeing these really clear disparities among Hispanic populations, black populations, and American, Indian, Alaskan native populations. Um, there are also uh, um, um, disparities in care for native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. Uh, they're not highlighted as statistically significant, but the trends show that they're also having issues with access to care. So here are also some uh, percentage of non-elderly adults. So again, from 18 to 64, um, with 14 or more physically or mentally unhealthy days in the past 30 days, right? So that's almost in one month, two weeks of your life, what are the percent of non-elderly adults that half of the time they were living in physically or they had physically or mentally unhealthy days. Could you imagine that where half of your month in the past month, half of it, two weeks, of the past month, you're saying, I really didn't feel that great. I'm not physically and mentally at a place where I call myself healthy. And you can see, again, some differences in um, uh, more than 14 physically unhealthy days and more than 14 mentally unhealthy days. And again, with little stars, you show that this is statistically significant where there are stars based, you know, over on top of the, the bar graph for uh, race and ethnicity. So you'll find that um, among white populations, 11% said in the past um, you know, 14 days or more, I've had less physically healthy days. Then you look and you see among Hispanic and American Indian and Alaskan natives, there are higher percentages. Um, when it came to mentally unhealthy days, 13% of white, 7% of, of Asian populations had, had uh, more than 14%. So, so that's actually um, a form of, you're, you're kind of asking like, what's going on in the, the Asian American population that they have some kind of protective factor where they have less mentally unhealthy days as compared to the white majority, um, Hispanic population, black, American Indian, Alaskan native, et cetera. What's going on here? And that's really cool. What can we learn from the Asian population who's got better physically, uh, physical health as well as mental health? What can we learn, right? That's, these are some numbers that can get really interesting 
Um, and the numbers will, will show you, you know, what's currently going on, but then through qualitative interview, interviewing people, talking to them, um, conducting focus groups, you can start asking what's going on in these cases and what can we learn? What can we do that's healthier? So everyone can have healthier lives, right? So it's kind of some interesting questions. You can use research tools to kind of dig a little deeper and figure out what can we do differently to, um, to have healthier lives. Infant mortality rate. And the reason why I'm highlighting this is because when we have the class on epigenetics, when we talk about how your biography and your biology interact, right? That you can be born with certain genes, but it's really your environment around you and the stress environment around you and the physical environment around you and your, and your, your, the mental health conditions around you, right? They really can impact your genetics. Um, when we talk about that class, we'll talk about this subject specifically, infant mortality rate. Looking at this chart, you can see that black adults, um, uh, mothers of, uh, you know, African American and black mothers have a much higher infant mortality rate. And we're going to watch a film and you have a homework assignment for that class on epigenetics, which goes through and describes what's happening here. Why is there such a high infant mortality rate um, among, among black parents? And so uh, I just, you know, if this is something that interests you um, as a topic, I'd recommend kind of bookmarking this slide or bookmarking this idea and, and thinking about maybe having this as your topic for the health disparities final project that you have. Um, and I've got some connections in town. I'm going to try to have some guest speakers coming, come from a birth foundation that talk about, again, race, ethnicity, um, as well as stress and what role longitudinal stress over your lifespan has uh, and even discrimination, what that has on birth outcomes. So if this is something interesting to you, jot it down, write it down, talk to a friend. Um, We'll talk a little bit more in depth about this in that class. Immigration and health. Now, the reason why I wanted to highlight this is to show you there's something that's called the Hispanic or the, also the healthy immigrant paradox. Paradox means like something's different here. It's something maybe that we expect, but we don't get that outcome. It's just something that's kind of like, huh, what's happening here? Um, this goes to show you that among Latino immigrants, right? So folks coming from Mexico and from Central America and even from South America and the islands who immigrate to the United States, they actually have health, healthier lives before they move to the United States, before they immigrate to the States, than when they start becoming more accustomed to the U.S. way of life. Um, and there could be numerous reasons for this, right? Um, if your family's been split apart, you've got higher levels of stress and you don't have the social support you used to have. Um, if you're living in poor living conditions, uh, you might not have the resources, you might not have the neighbors you trust. Um, suddenly you're taking on part of the U.S. lifestyle of getting the cheaper food, which tends to be less healthy, less fresh food. You're living in neighborhoods where maybe it's not as safe for you to go outside and be physically active. Maybe you don't have the time. Maybe you've got multiple jobs, right? Right. And also, if you're undocumented, you're less likely to try to go actually go out and actually use healthcare. And when I mean undocumented, um, I mean not legal with legal documents. Um, so you might have heard other people use the terms legal or illegal and alien. I, I prefer not to use those terms. I prefer to use undocumented or documentation. I don't like to call anyone an illegal person. Um, and again, this is just used to describe. And by the way, I'm also not saying that everyone who migrates from a, a Spanish-speaking country is undocumented, because that's that's just not true. Um, but what I wanted to show you through um, this particular graph was just the longer that people live in the United States, particularly um, Hispanic immigrants, the less healthier they become. And that that's the Hispanic paradox, and that's also called the healthy immigrant paradox. All right, gender and sex. So um, with this, I want to talk about, you know, two very different uh, topics. Well, three, actually. There's gender identity, which is how you enact your biological sex and how you see yourself in terms of your gender and how you display that from the clothes you wear, the way you wear your hair, um, your, your outward appearance, the way that you act, right? The way that you speak even is an enactment of how you see yourself in terms of your gender. When it comes to biological sex, that's that what are your chromosomes? How were you born? Um, 
And, you know, how does that dictate the way uh, that you uh, see yourself? But that's really more, your biological sex is really more of that hard science of what's the actual biological chromosome, you know, how were you initially born, whether it's, you know, male, female, um, intersex. Um, there's a really interesting book called Middlesex by uh, the author's name, Jeffrey Eugenides. And it's really interesting because it talks about what happens when there's someone who's born with both male and female parts and kind of how parents decide to raise this child. It's super interesting. If you get a chance, read it. It's great. It's a little bit older. Um, super interesting though. Uh, and then there's also uh, sexual orientation, which is totally even different from gender identity. And that's who you love. So I just thought this is a great illustration of how to um, differentiate these different terms that are all related back to gender and also uh, the, the biological sex, the more scientific, you know, what what were the set of genetics you were given at birth. I just thought this was kind of a provocative picture and we'll go, again, we'll talk a little bit more about um, gender identity and gender orientation as well as sexual orientation in an upcoming class when we talk about LGBT health. Um, and, and we'll also talk about some of the disparities that come from uh, gender, from um, gender identity, and from gender expression. This is from Pew Research Center. If there is an online think tank and survey group that I love and use for all of my social science classes, it's Pew Research Center. I highly recommend if you like topics of social science, if you like politics, if you like religion, if you like knowing what's the pulse and what do people think about certain topics, go on Pew Research Center. It is a playground of data. Um, you can nerd out on so many different topics. What do um, you know more religious people think in terms of politics? What do uh, what do people think about abortion? What do people think about um, gambling? What do um, you know based on your family of origin, how are you more likely to vote? Uh, what's the changing projection of family patterns? People are getting married younger, people are getting married older. There are even some really cool maps about where are all the single people living? If you're a heterosexual male, where's a better state for you to live? If you're a heterosexual female, or, um, you know, and there, there are others, it's not just, uh, that's a very heteronormative uh, approach. Uh, meaning kind of treating heterosexuality as the norm. Um, talk about this a little bit more soon, too, in class. I'm kind of dropping some big terms without diving too far into them. Anyway, this comes from Pew Research Center, where uh, individuals, there were um, almost 1,200 people who self-identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, were asked um, within the past year, what are ways in which you perceive discrimination? And if not in the past year, over your lifespan, what are forms of, of discrimination that, that, you've, um, that have occurred to you, that have happened to you, right? Or that you've also perceived? Whether or not you've been a subject to slurs or jokes, you've been rejected by a family member, um, possibly during the coming out process, right? When you're letting people know, hey, this is how I view myself and this is who I like, right? Uh, if you've been threatened or physically attacked. And you'll also find when we talk about LGBT health, you'll see health disparities in terms of stress, in terms of depression, in terms of, of violence, um, been made to feel unwelcome at a place of worship. Um, when people told you that the way that you're naturally wired is right or wrong, right? Or how you see yourself is right or wrong. Like, oh, no, 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 you've been, your biological sex is this, so therefore this is what society tells you you should, you should be, right? Um, whether or not you've received poor service or whether you've been, been treated unfairly. Uh, this also goes back to also housing, um, housing discrimination. And we'll talk about different laws and different efforts to try to reduce that discrimination um, and, and what are some of the impacts. Again, when we focus on um, sexual, I know some people like the term sexual minority and some people don't, don't, like, the, um, don't like that umbrella term. Um, but we'll just say for now, um, what are some of the perceived forms and actual forms of discrimination based on your gender identity and your sexual orientation? This is a picture I thought was really interesting. I used this more for global health a while back, but I just thought it was also something that was really great on 
demonstrating the way that women can be viewed negatively. This was a campaign put put on by the United Nations. So that if you were to go on Google and you type women are or women and then you look for descriptives, what are some of the words that pop up? And sometimes it's crazy or hormonal or um, weak or sexy. You know, the different ways in which women have been characterized over time uh, you know, sometimes in positive lights, but also sometimes in more negative lights. Um, and, and how does that actually physically impact women, right? Whether or not it increases your likelihood of being the subject of violence or if someone tries to dominate over you, or even, and this is an example of your earnings. Um, if you've heard about this, the glass ceiling for women, where it was hard for women to break through and get equal pay, uh, this shows you how over time that there's been a reduction in the amount of education between uh, between men and women. But it, although the pay is getting better for women, we're not there yet. We haven't reached the finish line to say women are, in fact, paid and compensated the same as men. Um, so, again, this shows you that women are getting higher and higher levels of education over time, but that doesn't necessarily translate to you're getting the same pay as a male colleague. Education. Um, so we also know that individuals with lower levels of education tend to fare poorer than folks who've had the opportunity to complete a high school degree, to complete a uh, college degree, right? Um, whether it's an associate or later on a bachelor's or even higher levels of education, which are kind of starting to become the new norm of a graduate education and, and how that impacts your health. So this graph I thought was just really super interesting. Look at the disparity between those with less than a high school graduate, a, less than a, a GED, less than a um, diploma versus those who are college graduates. Let's look between men and women. That's almost 55 years old and 48. 55 minus 48. Oh my gosh, it's an eight year difference. That's crazy, right? There's an eight year difference between someone who did not complete a high school, and this is just on average, uh, between a high school degree versus college, between women, you've got 53 and, what, 53.8 and 58.5, right? So it just shows you the higher you go in education, um, the, the older you're expected um, to live, right? And this is, uh, this is at age 25, how, how much longer you expect to live beyond, um, you know, how much longer are you expected to live? Women do, by the way, tend to outlive men. Um, that might be due to women more often go in for yearly examination. Um, women are less likely to suffer heart attacks as compared to men, or ha less often have they more often have cardiovascular diseases. Um, men men more often have the diseases that often lead to younger deaths as compared to women. Also disparity. This uh, this chart I'm expected I'm expecting you to memorize the entire thing. Um, just kidding, you are not expected to memorize this entire thing. I just wanted to show you by showing you this chart, um, this flow chart, the different ways that education impacts your health. Whether it's because you have the literacy skills and numeracy skills, meaning again uh, the ability to take numbers and translate them. You know, whether it's uh, in health literacy skills, which means someone gives you information and you can take it and you can translate it into something that you can use. Um, whether or not that impacts your health knowledge, your literacy and how you cope is going to directly relate to your health outcomes. Whether it impacts your work and your living conditions, where you live, what you have access to, what health care resources you have access to, based on more so your educational attainment as well as your opportunity in life and your income. That later directly impacts your health. And then whether or not it impacts the way you perceive how much power you have to protect your health, right? Whether or not it gives you that sense of internal or external locus of control. Uh, I'm in charge of my own health. It's more of an internal focus. I've got power to, to you know, go see my healthcare providers to enact preventive behaviors or whether or not you think kind of life happened to you, right? Like, oh, it just happened. I just got really sick or, oh, you know, over time, um, I lost, I lost my job and these things happened to me 
and therefore that impacts my health versus are there things you actually do if you have an internal locus of control to say, I've got some control, I'm going to enact certain behaviors that keep me healthier, right? Your social standing, again, just think of those monkeys in, in that film that you just watched, the macaque monkeys. Uh, those with higher levels of social standing seem to fare better overall. Those with lower social standing might not have the social support and, and the people they can call or reach out to if they, if they immediately need help or if they're scared um, is, is indicative of, of your social relationships, right? But also how you fare later. Do you, do, you have, do you have social connections that you can get the help you need over time? And then also your social networks. Uh, do, do you feel connected even within your own community? Um, and, and again, with time, uh, edu educational attainment impacts the jobs you get, where you live, um, who's in your social networks, which again, later on impact your health, where you live. So here's a global map, which shows you, um, the density of healthcare providers, specifically physicians based on where you live. And you can see here that in areas of like sub-Saharan Africa, um, you know, north of Australia and these, in the, 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 the Pacific Oceans and these Pacific Islands, people have a lot harder time accessing healthcare. And in terms that can, in, in turn, that can impact um, whether or not when you're sick, uh, when you need help with even preventive care, whether or not you have access to that. So folks living in these countries with uh, poor access to care also tend to have poor health outcomes. You know, do you have access to, to immunizations? If you're going into labor, do you have skilled health workers who can help you deliver a child, right? To do, to do something that's so natural and so normal, but makes it so much easier if you've got access to care. And here's just something that came from an active living research organization, activelivingresearch.org, which shows that also the built community around you, the built environment around you, where you live, do you have sidewalks? Um, you know, are you, are you able to get physical activity squeezed into your day? Do you have access to healthier foods? Do you live in a place that's got green space? Do you live in an environment that has less air pollution? Do you have access to good water? Are you comfortable in your life? That also impacts your health. And this just gives you an example. And again, we'll go into more detail about built environment when uh, we have an entire class on built environment that focuses a little bit more on physical activity and income. Um, so these next slides kind of show it's not just that bottom income. It's not just your income and where you live now that impacts your health. Um, it's not just that, that bottom line number. It's also your access to education, your access to food. What happens if you're unemployed? Um, what happens if you're in poverty? Um, and sometimes it's not a matter of, again, what is the, the, the income disparity, but are you able, do you live in an area where you've got economic mobility. So let's say that you change jobs or you have a way to get a higher education based on standard of living and cost of living and the way that people are treated in your, in your community. Do you have a chance of going up or down the socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic ladder? And these show you some places where it's a little bit harder to do it. Um, you know, where places that have the best upward mobility, um, you know, are, are what also has the least economic mobility. Again, this is a little bit older, so some of these cities have changed. This also shows you a map of where location matters, that if you're born into poverty, where it's a little bit harder to get out of poverty. What you see here is a concentration really within what's known as the Bible Belt. These tend to be some of the uh, poor states such as Mississippi, uh, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, West Virginia. Well, West Virginia is actually kind of more neutral. Parts of Arizona, that's actually kind of parts of the reservation that you'd see kind of highlighted if you're looking over towards Arizona, where, again, you could be earning more and you could, um, you could have a different education, you can have a different outcome, but kind of based on where you're living, you might not have the same kind of opportunity as if you lived in other areas. So what are some of the take home, um, what are some of the take home messages of, of this chapter? Um, health is so much more than just access to care. It's, it's tied to the distribution of resources 
often also link back to your socioeconomic status, where you live, who you are, what kind of privilege have you been born into or not. Um, racism adds an extra health burden. You can't, you can't tease out uh, racial and ethnic discrimination over the years and say, this is its own thing. It's really tied in together as to the opportunity that you've had, that your parents have had, that your grandparents have had over the years. Um, our choices are shaped by the choices we have. Context is everything. Um, if you live in a high demand, if you have a high demand job, but you have low control, it's going to lead to that chronic stress, which we know is horrible for you. It leads to the buildup of cortisol. And that in turn increases your chances of developing certain chronic diseases, right? And that stress is deadly. Um, inequality is bad for all of our health, but especially those who suffer disproportionate levels or amounts of inequality. Um, as the video showed you earlier, social policy is health policy. By, by doing things that increase affordable housing, that increase um, higher wages for people, that increase education, um, by some of these programs that are there to help people get back up on their feet, right? Uh, for, and you sometimes for a short amount of time, sometimes for a longer amount of time. Those are actually social policies that impact our health. So social policy is health policy. Um, Health inequities are neither uh, natural nor inevitable. We created these social constructions of health. We created these parameters, right? These, these boxes where we put people in. We constructed these so we can do things. We can change things as a society to change the way we talk about people, the way we define people that might bring up equality, right? And, and equity. And we all pay the price for poor health as you've seen on the video. One person suffers in our community, we all suffer, right? So uh, I did have a question I was going to ask you guys. If we could, if you could magic, wave a magic wand, what would you do to reduce health disparities? The big answer should not be tell people how to live healthier lives because, again, that is taking into consideration privilege and kind of, again, wiping out all context and saying we all have the same equal ability to enact healthy behaviors, which Again, we know we're all given different um, hands, right? Different deck of cards, and, and we've got different choices in our lives that will impact our health outcomes. So what can we do to try to reduce disparities? Well, try to create some social policies that make health more equitable for all. And with that said, we are done with today's lecture. Thank you.